Dr. Melissa Johansson, a geologist and director of Geoid Energy Limited, a company that specializes in subsurface characterization of rocks. Today we're on Penarth Beach, which is south, five miles south of Cardiff, and we're going to look at the Triassic rocks, uh, which you can see behind me. These rocks are characterized by the red and the base with a gradual transition to grey. And the reasons for this coloration is because they were formed in a barren, arid desert, which was part of Pangaea, which was formed 251 million years ago and spanned 50 million years until 201 million years where the beginning of the Triassic. Today we're going to look at uh, some of the reasons for the coloration to the grey as the barren desert became inundated with sea and became more marine. Here at the base of the Mercia mudstone group is the red mudstone member, part of the Mercia group, which is overlain by the blue anchor formation. It is composed of a hematite, which is a ferric oxide mineral, which goes red because it oxidizes, um, just like any rusting. But what's really interesting about this, this lower level, it's got uh, evaporites, uh, which com are composed of gypsum, which form from the evaporation of a brine um, when there's very, very hot climates, like in Nevada, you would see the formation of gypsum, you see it in the modern day. And it's a, a calcium sulfate, um, so it can become quite acidic if it's dissolved. But these form these beautiful white horizons uh, along the beach and can be quite friable um, because they dissolve uh, in, in, in water due to the rainfall. And they are part of this, this layer upon layer of red beds from the from the mudstone, the terrestrial mudstone, remember this hematite, which is um, uh, iron rich, which becomes oxidized and becomes red as it rusts or equivalent to rusting, interspersed with these gray layers where you have the sort of a lagoon setting um, where it's less oxidized and you have the gray coloration. discussed about the Triassic, it's a, it was a climate of hot and arid uh, temperatures. We have been looking on the beach for evidence of this and, and on this bed, which is part of the, the blue anchor formation, uh, which is above the red mudstones, even though we have said that that grey colour was due to marine incursions, um, we do see evidence still of desiccation as this gradual change, as the sea level rises, we have a mix of terrestrial and marine sediments. And on this surface of the bed, um, we see these shapes. Uh, these are called polygons, which means many-sided shape. And they have uh, rims where there is a sort of erosion, uh, ridges around, which is where when you have a mudstone bed um, and it's desiccated, which means it dries out uh, because of the hot weather, so you have more evaporation than rainfall, the beds dry out and form uh, these tensile stresses within the mud cause a contraction or a shrinkage and we have this polygon shape and we can clearly see this full this surface of many polygons with uh, which indicate a, a dried out bed which suggests back to this hot hot arid climate we've discussed earlier about this uh, climate was dry but we also have evidence of, of where it was uh, flash floods or it was uh, mudstone was wet which shows evidence where the, the mud was soft sediment and we know this because we now see footprints preserved and the, and the squishing or the, the liquefaction of the, of the mud um, due to the footprints and we're going to take a look at some of these footprints here and what is interesting is you have the rim around the, the, the footprint. So here is the heel of the foot. Um, and then we have three sort of toes, like a, if you imagine an elephant type footprint. And here, this is the rim where the mud is squished up, has moved up due to the compaction of the soil, of the wet fluid soil as it's increased. And we have a series of footprints along this layer of beach. Um, or lagoon or, or a shoreside, um, which uh, show that the dinosaur is moving along, possibly running, and, um, and it's called a trackway. 
uh, and is a strong indication for the onset of reptiles in the Triassic period. So although we describe the Pangaea as a barren, uh, windy, uh, uh, with flash floods uh, area, we know there must be some vegetation source to sustain this herbivorous uh, reptile, the, the Eusauropus. grey section, which we see lying above the red uh, mudstone of the Mercia group, is the blue anchor formation. And it lies obviously gradation, uh, gradationally above. And what we've seen is that as we have the lower red uh, coloration, which we've described as this ferric oxide, uh, like a rusting of the iron from the hematite, we now go into an environment that has less oxidation. Uh, and that's why we have this grey colour and it's called the blue anchor formation. And the grey colour is because that iron-rich sediment doesn't no longer oxidises because it's covered in water, where obviously the oxygen is reduced. And what we see are these different colours, the different layers, and these are called bedding planes. And they mark changes in, in the water uh, level, the depth of the water system. And so the more grey, uh, friable uh, sediments, that is the, mud, uh, the, the, the shale that is in a more marine setting, we have the light beige, which is probably a more sandy, uh, rippled uh, bed where we have shallower seas or shallower lagoons or shallower water, wherever we are in the environment. And then overlying it, we still see elements of the red but where we have this terrestrial, uh, where we, we have sea level change. So when we have the sea level rise, um, it's not a one event which we consider. It is a orbital or a slow change in water depths. Uh, with incursions of marine influences returning to back and recurring levels. And this is why we see the multiple layers as the sea level changes over time. So these are ripples and, and, and what you see here is this is called the stoss and that's the lee side. And the water flows, so the incoming flow takes the sand ripple, the sand grain, over the back of this ripple and over the front and it helps you identify the direction of flow so although we know with the sea it comes in and out these preserve ripples um, and if the tides are equal you'll have this symmetrical ripple um, so but these are asymmetrical with a long back what we see here on the beach is this beautiful uh, piece of rock that clearly you can see ridges forming along the rock and these are preservations of, of ripples which are formed from the traction of sand grains due to either wind or flu fluvial movement and what you see here is that the the flow is towards the beach on this piece of rock and the, and the sand grains move up the stoss side and down the lee side of a of, of the ripple and it migrates the lee side migrates down and preserves the ridges of the ripple and this is from the Triassic age more than likely it's from the Lilstock formation towards the top um, as these are common within those beds and are more evidence um, that we are seeing a much more uh, marine influence I'm interpreting that these are probably from a fluvial or marine setting um, due to the fact that in the Lilstock we also see uh, fish bones uh, and fish teeth which suggests obviously that we're in water um, and so this here uh, these are beautiful pieces of rock that you can find on Penoff Beach. What we're building up is a picture of a wet and drying uh, environment, similar to um, Playa Lake, which we could see in Nevada, which is, has these ephemeral, which means these flash flooding events, uh, lagoons forming, uh, water everywhere, then drying up back to the hot arid climate. And this is the, the, the conditions during the Triassic. So today we've had this fabulous day, um, looking at the mud cracks, the gypsum, the red beds, the, the grey beds, which have built up this picture of this semi-arid environment during the Triassic. And what is important to note is not just that these are geologically uh, important pieces of information, these have uh, strong, uh, important economic um, implications um, and usage. So the Mercia mudstones form a cap for a, the Sherwood sandstones in Morecambe Bay gas fields. And if we go to carbon capture storage, these fractures and friable nature of the sediments is important as we inject CO2. 
The gypsum is used for alabaster tiles, or has been, and it's been mined since the 17th century. Uh, and you can see them in City Hall um, and, and the museum uh, in Cardiff. And we see that the Mercia member is also the bedrock for most of the houses uh, and infrastructure around Wales and the UK. And from the evidence we saw for swelling and contraction during desiccation, um, this also has implications for our building stock, uh, your own houses. Uh, during hot weather, they will, the, mud, so the bedrock will shrink and during rainfall it will swell. Um, the gypsum, the sulphate from the gypsum can cause uh, sulfuric acid and, and also corrupt cement. So understanding this kind of rock system is important, not only geologically, but also economically. Thank you for watching this video and I just want to acknowledge and thank uh, my dog Alex uh, who, as you would have observed I hope has three legs and has walked over eight kilometres today um, over some difficult terrain and, and still wagging his tail at the end.